can an arm be replaced by a weaponized cannon? Was there ever really a friendship between Guts and Griffith? And what other physical and mental injuries has Guts picked up throughout the Berserk anime? Hi guys and welcome back, where today we're going to be taking another look at the Berserk anime. Thank you everyone for your support with my last Berserk video. Please let me know down below if there's any other aspect of this anime that you'd like me to break down, for example the Eclipse episode. Otherwise, as always, if you're ready, let's begin. So here we see Gambino, Guts' adoptive father, trying to take Guts' life. But to be honest, Guts could have probably seen this coming as Gambino wasn't really the best father figure. Whether it was abusing him physically or mentally or selling him into sexual exploitation, Gambino just didn't like him. But how did this experience go on to shape Guts as an adult? Well, we know that in the absence of secure attachments, like having parents or siblings, that people can go on to struggle with relationships in later life, contributing to feelings of loneliness and isolation, which might explain why Guts goes on to be a stoic character and having this lone wolf persona throughout the series. <laughs> So why does Gambino resent Guts to the point of wanting to murder him? Well firstly, as he states, he blames Guts for the death of his partner, Shiso. She was the one that decided to take on Guts as a baby, but died shortly after from the plague. But is that really Guts' fault? Well, the plague was a deadly bacterial infection that was primarily spread from the bite of infected fleas. And typically rats would be carriers of these fleas, and as rats tend to feed off of anything, they may have come across Guts as a baby, transferred the fleas to him, and then onto Shisu, possibly contributing to her death. Not only this, but Gambino had been a celebrated warrior before all of these injuries, taking Guts under his wing. And now to be dependent upon this young boy, or even seen in his shadow, was just too much for Gambino's pride, hence leading him to murder. Gosh, what a gruesome circumstance to be born whilst your mother is being hung. But is such a thing even possible? Well, in circumstances like these, when the mother's heart has stopped, unless that baby is born promptly, they too will die. You see, a baby solely depends upon the maternal blood supply that passes through the placenta. Without this, the baby doesn't get any oxygen and also has no means of excreting any waste products. So the fact that Guts wasn't premature and survived this whole ordeal was really a miracle and speaks to his ability to survive. <laughs> Gosh, stabbing Gambino straight through the heart. Clearly a decision that Guts makes in the moment to allow him to survive, but I'd imagine that it's going to give him PTSD for the rest of his life. In fact, I seem to remember in the manga, in a far later scene, when Guts is being intimate with Katsuka, that he has a nightmare reliving this event. And it's interesting because studies have shown that children who go on to become child soldiers, who are surrounded by violence and are under the constant threat of harm, do in fact go on to develop PTSD. This makes reintegration with society far more challenging, which might account for why Guts goes on to become a lone wolf character. So considering that Guts is only around 11 years old at this point, and so far he's lost both his biological and foster mother, his father has sold him into prostitution and then tried to kill him, it's a bit of an understatement to say that he's been through a lot. And then on top of this to be told that it's all your fault, I'm not surprised you might develop self-loathing thoughts and behaviour, like, would I be better off if I was dead? I sure do hope that life gets a bit easier for him as the story goes on. 
So here you have the first interaction between Guts and Griffith, and you can tell their personality differences by the way that they fight. Guts is clearly a powerhouse, almost like a caged animal, whereas Griffith is more of an elegant tactician, as we can see him aiming for all of Guts' weak points, such as his tendons. Remember that tendons are what attach muscles to bones, and so if you sever them, you'll render that limb useless. But it looks like Griffith targets every limb except for Guts' dominant side, which tells us that Griffith had no intentions of ending Guts' sword fighting career. <laughs> So, a shoulder dislocation is an incredibly painful injury, and Griffiths has done this with almost surgical precision. You see, the shoulder has what's called a ball and socket joint, whereby the humerus sits nicely into the cup of the shoulder joint. Here, Griffith has caused an anterior dislocation, which is actually the commonest way to dislocate your shoulder. This is due to multiple factors, but mainly it's due to the front part of your shoulder having far less support than the back. And really what this is showing is that having an understanding of the human body and anatomy goes a long way in combat. And just to relocate that shoulder, you'll need several people applying counter-traction before it clicks back into place. So, up until now, Guts has understood the world as survival of the fittest through combat, using any means at his disposal to help defeat his opponent. And yes, that even includes biting your opponent's sword or throwing dirt in their eyes to claim an advantage. And Griffith identifies this trait in Guts as he too had to use these methods to win. And so, when it came to defeating him, he knew that he had to completely incapacitate him by dislocating his shoulder. But the part that's really interesting is where Griffith then spares Guts. For some readers, they may see this as a moment of mercy or kindness or the start of a friendship. But I think that Griffith thinks about this very differently. You see, Griffith, above everything else, is a tactician. And I think he knows that he stumbled across a hidden gem in Guts. You see, he's found someone like him, someone who's willing to fight both tooth and nail to the very end to claim his win. And he knows that if he gets him on side, he'll be more valuable than a hundred men, helping Griffith to attain his dream. <laughs> So, there are multiple occasions where Griffith goes into battle to save Guts' life. But, does this mean that Griffith cares for Guts, and what is the impact on their relationship? Well, let's look at it from both perspectives, because it helps us to understand the relationship dynamic as they go forward. So, Guts seeing that Griffith is willing to save him rather than sacrifice him as a disposable soldier helps to build both loyalty and trust in their relationship. Also, it produces a life debt for Guts to fulfil in defending Griffith. But taking a step back and looking at their whole friendship, it makes you wonder whether Guts has something like a Stockholm Syndrome. And what I mean by this is Guts is effectively owned by Griffith. And over time, we see that Guts develops both affection, empathy and even loyalty to Griffith and his cause. Whereas from Griffith's perspective, as more of a tactician, he sees his soldiers more as chess pieces on a board game. Sure, he's willing to give up some pawns as cannon fodder, but what he's not willing to give up or lose are one of his queens or castles without a fight. Remember, in the game of chess, they're your best form of attack as well as your defence. So really, this is the turning point for the Guts and Griffiths story. 
Guts has a glimpse behind the curtain and sees how Griffiths visualises people. However, despite seeing this, Guts still naively pursues Griffiths' acknowledgement, still wanting to have this status of being considered an equal or a friend. It kind of reminds me of that stereotypical relationship between a father and son, where the son wants to be acknowledged as a man in his own right in his father's eyes. Maybe it's because Guts didn't have this conventional upbringing with his parents that he imprints it on his relationship with Griffith. But what Guts doesn't see is the bigger picture, in that Griffith is a narcissist and doesn't want anyone to be his equal. I mean, the guy is actually pursuing the goal of becoming a king, and no one is equal to that of a king. In fact, we see confirmation of this later on, where Griffith sacrifices all of his loyal soldiers just to attain his goal. So it looks like all of those years on the front line for Guts has allowed him to overcome Griffith's physical prowess. And in winning this duel, it's allowed him to break the shackles that kept him attached to the band of Hawks, allowing him to continue his journey and evolve further as a character. But it's interesting there seeing that Griffith is paralysed and shocked by the outcome of this duel. Is it because he's lost a great friend and soldier, or is it because he's lost power and control over something that he thought was his? Let me know your thoughts down below. <laughs> so it looks like Guts' training mainly revolves around functional, strength and conditioning training. And all of this is really useful for how he's going to be implementing his fitness. For example, if you want to get quicker and better at swinging a sword, then swing a sword. If you want to build your fight endurance, then do this for a far longer time. And if you want to achieve a far more powerful slice, then swing one of the heaviest swords you could find. And overall, Guts has got a pretty impressive physique. I think he stands at about 6 foot 5, he's got a massive neck, back and arms, all of which would have been developed with this kind of sword training. But how realistic would it be for a real human to be swinging a 200 pound sword? I'm not so sure. So here Guts actually begins to show some signs of mental growth and possibly even recovery from his past traumas. You see, when someone's been a victim of violence or been through a lot of trauma, it's quite common for them to have feelings of self-loathing, low self-esteem and self-worth. And you could argue that as a result of this, Guts' purpose has only ever been defined by others. But it looks like from this scene that he's beginning to develop purpose of his own, which is a far more positive and optimistic mental state to be in, considering everything that he's been through. <laughs> So, at this point, Griffiths has been in captivity, being tortured for the last 12 months. And possibly stemming from a sense of guilt, but Guts has accepted and promised to help rescue Griffiths before continuing on his own personal journey. However, after becoming intimate with Katsuka, I suspect, depending on her loyalties with Griffith, that Guts might end up sticking around. <laughs> and just when he started getting back into great shape and having a good mental state doing things for himself, a woman seems to be dragging him back to bad habits and back to Griffiths. <laughs> And here we see that Guts is crying over the state he's found Griffiths in, and this shows just how much he meant to him as a friend, as well as someone that he aspired to be like. 
And although Griffith meets this with what looks like an affectionate embrace, it's actually more likely that this hand over Guts's neck has aggressive intent, with Griffith blaming Guts for having gone through this whole ordeal. This really helps to show that the real stoic and tragic character of the whole Berserker story is actually Griffith as opposed to Guts. I say this because at least Guts has processed some of his trauma and form attachments, whether that's intimate with Katska or forming a more family bond with the Band of Hawks. Whereas Griffith, on the other hand, has remained a lonely narcissist with no real attachments other than to his blind ambition. So, so, this is proof of Griffith being truly evil. In this one act of sacrificing everyone, he's shown that no one, not even Guts, meant anything to him. Really, this is the first time that Guts has really seen with true clarity who Griffith really was. And I have to admit, there was a moment there where I was convinced that Griffiths had true feelings of love towards Guts. But we now see that that was all an illusion of perception. <laughs> God, so using the blunt side of a blade to cut through bone. That must have taken everything that Guts had. And from what I understand that goes on later on in the anime, that he gets that arm stitched back up with what I presume would be a skin flap. He then gets a cannon attachment to that side as a weapon, which I guess could be a real thing. My only reservation with using a weapon like this would be the impact from the recoil of shooting that cannon and it causing further damage to his wounds. <laughs> Gosh, so just having to witness something like this happen to someone that you love would be mental torture enough, and I'm sure it's not going to be something that Guts is easily going to overcome. In fact, I can imagine that it's going to impact any form of intimacy that Guts and Katska have going forward. But tell me this, isn't she actually pregnant with Guts' baby already? Anyway, to have your eye gouged out whilst watching this is just too much. Really, once the integrity of the eyeball has been breached, it's going to be damaged beyond repair, and there's not going to be very much that you can do to help treat this. Back in the medieval times, rather than allowing this eyeball tissue just to rot and become infected, it would have had to have been treated with cauterization, most likely using a hot prong, which, thinking about it in of itself, is a bit nightmare inducing. Okay guys, let me know down below your further recommendations. If you want to stick around, I've left two more videos up here. Otherwise, if I don't see you, Merry Christmas everyone, and I'll see you in the new year. Thanks.